Welcome back everyone. In this video, we'll continue our discussion on chapter one, discussing the various procedures for collecting data. So first, we will take a deeper look at some of the common data collection methods, including experiments, phone surveys, written questionnaires and surveys, as well as direct observations and interviews. Next, we will briefly cover some of the other data collection techniques and then wrap it up with a discussion on some of the common data collection issues. So let's get started. The first type of data collection method that we're gonna talk about is an experiment. An experiment is a process that produces a single outcome whose result cannot be predicted with certainty. With experimental design, this involves looking at a particular variable of interest and then we measure or observe how the changes in the experiment impact that variable of interest. Another form of data collection technique that you might be familiar with is phone surveys. Some typical applications include political polls, market research, customer satisfaction surveys, and even healthcare studies. If you're anything like me, I'm sure you probably avoid solicitation calls and maybe even block them as spam. That presents a lot of challenges collecting data with phone surveys. Another challenge is it requires trained callers to consistently conduct the surveys. Next, we're gonna examine written questionnaires and surveys in greater detail. So let's dive into the major steps and compare phone and written questionnaire surveys. As you can see here, phone surveys and written questionnaire surveys are very similar in structure. They both include identifying an issue to study, and then we need to define the population of interest or the participants that we want to study. Then we need to develop the questionnaires to ask and then test the survey or pilot it before sending it out to the broader group. Next, we need to figure out the appropriate sample size and sampling method and then we need to pick our sample and then send out the surveys or make the phone calls. Now we'll take a more detailed look at written questionnaires. We're going to go into the differences from phone surveys, some of the advantages and disadvantages. And finally, we will check out different types of questions that can be used in the survey and then compare some example questions. So let's dive into the differences first. Some key differences between written questionnaires and phone surveys are they must be carefully formatted. So it must look professional, easy to read with clear directions, you know, otherwise people really won't want to take it. There also needs to be a motivational statement of purpose. So unlike a phone survey where you can try to verbally convince somebody to participate, your written questionnaire must have a convincing purpose statement. With written questionnaires, you can also ask open-ended questions it's also less expensive to administer. Finally, we can easily distribute email questionnaires or written questions versus having to train callers to conduct the surveys. So some typical applications are employee satisfaction surveys at companies. I'm sure you've taken a course or instructor evaluation previously in another course. Also, purchase receipts often have surveys and they try to encourage you to complete them by offering a discount or something free on your next visit. And then finally, there's academic research. Now, some of the key advantages with written questionnaires is that they are standardized for all respondents. So this is because we're asking consistent questions of everyone. And then if it's online, the data can be captured electronically and then more easily downloaded for analysis purposes. Also, you can potentially ask more questions. Some of the disadvantages is that the responses returned may not be timely. Another major disadvantage of a written survey is that the response rates are low. When I get a survey, I either don't respond or I don't respond right away. Then there's also no chance to clarify questions. So if a survey is unclear and the respondent wants to ask a question, they really don't have anyone to contact. Some of the key types of questions you should be aware of are demographic questions, which are related to a respondent's backgrounds, characteristics, and attributes. This might be your race or ethnicity. 
Closed-in questions is where respondents get to choose from a short list of defined choices. So in other words, it's a multiple choice question. So for instance, which political party do you belong to, Republican, Democratic, or other? Open-ended questions, respondents have the freedom to respond with any value, words, or statements. So for example, this might be, why did you choose to attend Miracosta College? Let's compare two example questions to see which one is better. So in A here, do you agree with most other reasonably minded people that the city should spend more money on neighborhood parks? Or B, in your opinion, should the city increase spending on neighborhood parks? So what do you think? In this case, B is the better question because A has bias because it's encouraging the respondent to answer in a particular way by highlighting that other reasonably minded people think we should spend more money on parks. Here is another example. A, how much money do you make at your job? Or B, which of the following categories best reflects your weekly income from your current job? Under $500, $500 to $1,000, or over $1,000? So what do you think about this one? So B is better again because A is too vague. It doesn't specify if it's annual, hourly, monthly, or weekly income, whereas B specifies a time frame and it's closed ended in that it gives you options to choose from. With income questions, respondents may be sensitive to providing detailed information. With direct observations, the data collection process involves physical observation of the activity and recording what takes place. Personal observation can be very time consuming and you do get personal perception issues with this method as different observers could see a situation in a different way. Some typical applications might be determining what customers like. So salespeople on the floor could observe what customers are trying on and purchasing versus putting back. You can also observe seatbelt usage, such as at a checkpoint. And then within a company, it can also be used to assess compliance with company safety policies. For instance, if you work in a lab, you can do an inspection and observe to see if everyone is wearing their appropriate safety equipment like lab coats and eyewear. Another form of data collection is personal interviews. With personal interviews, you can have structure where your questions are scripted or unstructured. Unstructured in the sense that you start with one or two questions and then you follow up based on the responses that you get from the participant. So some typical applications here are customer satisfaction surveys, supplier qualifications, and health status measurements. If you have ever visited a doctor and the nurse or doctor asks you questions about your health, they are interviewing you. Finally, let's recap and compare all four methods. So experiments can provide controls with pre-planned objectives, but are costly, time consuming, and require planning from the researcher. Telephone surveys can provide more timely information and are relatively inexpensive. But as we know, they have a poor reputation and a stigma. They can also have a limited scope of what information can be gathered. Mailer questionnaires or written surveys are cost effective, they can expand in length, and we can use open-ended questions. But people don't typically respond, and the respondent cannot get clarification on a question that they might have. And then finally, direct observation and personal interviews expands the analysis opportunities, and there's no respondent bias. However, there is potential observer bias, and they can be costly. Let's jump into some of the other data collection techniques. The first one that you might encounter are focus groups. This is a group interview where the facilitator is trying to understand the group's perspective or opinions on something. So in general with focus groups, you're looking for a group that has some common attributes. Companies often study documents and records. This is when we are working with existing data contained in databases, financial records, annual reports, etc. Data analysts spend a good amount of their time working with databases. 
We won't go into detail on the next two, but barcodes on products and then radio frequency identification devices or RFID scanners are ways for data to be automatically transmitted using scanning devices. Now, let's dive into some of the data collection issues that you might encounter. As you read Chapter 1, make sure you pay close attention to all of these data collection issues. We may encounter issues whenever we're collecting data, whether it's data accuracy and how good is the data that is coming in. Is there interview bias towards a particular outcome or position? Non-responsive bias is just when participants don't respond because they don't want to or they're not interested. Selection bias is where we may be selecting a certain type of participant and they only give us a narrow view of information. As mentioned, observer bias is when observations might be biased towards the opinion of the observer. Then measurement error is where we may be collecting data using measurement tools and there may be an issue with the tool itself. With data collection, internal and external validity are also very important. Internal validity is where data is collected in a way that we can eliminate effects of variables within the experimental environment that we don't care about. So in other words, we're able to take away the noise that might affect our data. External validity is if we could take the results and generalize it beyond the test environment. So if we repeat the experiment in another context, will we get the same results? So make sure you understand the data collection issues as you'll be identifying these in your project in the future. Well, that wraps up this video covering procedures for collecting data. In our next video, we'll discuss populations, samples, and the different sampling techniques.